Venezuela joined international celebrations for the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party and the 47th anniversary of diplomatic relations between both nations. The clinical trials of Cuba's Soberana O2 vaccine candidate in children continue, now moving to children aged between 3 and 11 years old. Ethiopia's government declared an immediate unilateral ceasefire in the northern Tigray region this Monday, as rebels seized the regional capital, sending federal government officials fleeing. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada, and now we begin with the news. Venezuela joined international celebrations for the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party and also for the 47th anniversary of diplomatic relations between both nations. In a ceremony in Caracas, the president, Nicolás Maduro Moros, and Ambassador Li Bauron highlighted the strong friendship between China and Venezuela and also the historic achievements of Chinese communists. because we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of the glorious Communist Party of China, the party of the Chinese People's Revolution, the party of the glorious heroic past, the party of the gigantic future of the 21st century and beyond. Our sister, China, and we are celebrating 47 years of diplomatic relations. The Communist Party of China, of a small party with only 59 members, it has become the world's largest Marxist party with more than 91 million members and more than 70 years of governance in the world's largest socialist country with more than 90% of popular support. And Telesur was awarded Venezuela's annual National Journalism Award. This time it was the special prize honoring the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Carabobo, which sealed the country's independence from Spain in 1821. President Nicolás Maduro Moros handed the award to our colleague Susana Segovia at a ceremony in Miraflores, the Venezuelan presidential palace, on Monday. The jury valued the quality of Telesur's huge journalistic coverage of and around the Carabobo battle commemorations. The National Journalism Award is named after Venezuelan founding father Simón Bolívar. Awards were also handed to different journalist categories, ranging from television to print, news coverage and investigations, among others. In his speech at the Journalism Awards ceremony, President Nicolás Maduro urged opposition parties to follow the lead of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela last Sunday in selecting pre-candidates for primary elections. It has been a separate process. Hopefully, all the political parties in the country will open their fruit gates and give their militants the right to their grassroots leaders to exercise power and run their candidates for the November 21 mega elections. Hopefully. All parties, left, right, center, left, center, right, hopefully, one of the conclusions is the need for the deep democratization of the political life of the country, of social life of the country. We are going to elections on November 21 and made the one who presents the best program, the best candidate, and mobilize the people in their favor win. President Maduro also announced the termination of the figure of protectorates established to implement state policies in federal state and also municipalities run by the opposition. We want to go out to war with that united opposition and win whoever has to win. And I announce it from this election, I think the best thing is to win whoever wins gets to the government in your state, in your municipality, and what belongs to us. It's up to me to eliminate what we've called the protectorate. No more state and municipality protectors to rule. Whoever wins and good things, we are going to see how they get rid of that protectorate. 
Several sectors of Colombian society took to the streets this Monday as they mark two months since the national strike mobilizations against the government of President Ivan Duque began. Protesters continue to demand justice for the more than 80 people killed during the demonstrations. The dozens of disappeared and the dozens injured at the hands of the security forces, most notably the mobile anti-riot squadron, notorious for its human rights abuses for years. The wide-scale mobilizations and human rights violations have drawn attention to the systemic violence in Colombia, a country whose population demands peace and basic living standards from a corrupt paramilitary government. far-right Peruvian presidential candidate Keiko Fujimori continues in her maneuvers to take power, despite losing the June 6 elections. Now she's urging the country's interim leader to seek an international audit of the vote. Fujimori delivered a letter to interim president Francisco Sagasti, urging him to seek an election audit from international organizations. This despite the fact that international observers from across the world, including the Organization for American States, which played such a key role in the 2019 coup in Bolivia, confirmed that the elections were free and fair. Fujimori is desperate to avoid jail as she faces an imminent trial of corruption charges, which will be delayed if she were to assume the presidency. Winning candidate Pedro Castillo is yet to be announced as president-elect, as the electoral authorities continue to study each of Fujimori's baseless claims of fraud. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The clinical trials of Cuba's Soberano 2 vaccine in children continue. This Monday, the first 25 children aged between 3 and 11 years old received the initial dose of the vaccine candidate. The latest stage of the trials comes after the study of the safety of the dose when applied to the same number of adolescents aged between 12 and 18. A total of 350 children between the ages of 3 and 18 are said to be vaccinated as part of this pediatric trial, which comes after the announcement that two of the three doses of the Soberana O2 candidate applied to adults has shown 62% efficacy, with the third dose expected to further increase effectiveness against the novel coronavirus. And Russia imposed new restrictions this Monday to contain the rapid spread of the novel coronavirus as the Delta variant causes record deaths in its two main cities. Both Moscow and St. Petersburg surpassed their respective daily records from COVID-19 deaths over the weekend. This despite the progressive implementation of restrictive measures such as the return to mandatory teleworking for part of the population and obligatory vaccination for a minimum percentage of service sector employees. According to the World Health Organization, the fast-spreading Delta variant, first identified in India, is present in at least 18 countries, forcing some of them to review their strategies. Systemic racism against black people must be immediately dismantled around the world, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, said on Monday. Otherwise, crimes like the murder of U.S. African-American George Floyd will be repeated. In typical fashion, she did not mention the United States by name. Bachelet's recommendations come three days after former policeman Derek Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison for murdering Floyd in Minneapolis in May 2020. and start dismantling racism, to end impunity and build trust, to listen to the voices of people of African descent, and to confront past legacies and deliver redress. Only approaches that tackle both the endemic shortcomings in law enforcement and address systemic racism 
and the legacies it is built on will do justice to the memory of George Floyd and so many others whose lives have been lost or irreparably damaged. And protesters paraded through the streets of Bari in southern Italy on Monday, demonstrating against the arrival of foreign ministers from the G20 countries who were meeting at an official reception nearby. The demonstrators expressed their condemnation of the policies of powerful nations united in this bloc, including migration policies and a global financial system that reproduces poverty for the majority and wealth for the few. They also called for concrete action to face the climate crisis. The foreign ministers of the world's 20 largest economies are set to hold the summit in the nearby city of Matera on Tuesday. Swedish Prime Minister Stefan Löfven resigned on Monday, a week after losing a no-confidence vote in Parliament. Löfven could have either called a snap election or resigned following the vote last week. He said the snap election was not convenient for the country in the midst of a pandemic. Regular general elections are due next year. The vote of no-confidence was prompted by the left party when Löfven moved away from agreed housing policies to support a right-wing sponsor bill skipping rent regulations for newly constructed housing. Lovven led a social democratic green minority government with external support from the left party. The Speaker of Parliament, Andreas Norlean, is now in charge of negotiating a new prime minister among conservative opposition parties. Western Military Alliance, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, announced drills in the Black Sea in the wake of tension with Russia, following a provocative incursion of a UK destroyer into Russian territorial waters last week. A dozen NATO ships are said to participate in the military exercise in the Black Sea, a pressure point in the Eastern European region that sets the pace on tensions between Russia and the North Atlantic Alliance bloc. Moscow has made clear it will not tolerate any trespassing of its maritime borders, warning that a repeat of the British destroyer provocation could lead to an armed response. NATO countries do not recognize Russia's sovereignty over Crimea, which returned to the motherland after a referendum in 2014. Russia and China will continue their strategic alliance. Their 2001 bilateral treaty on friendship and cooperation has been extended, Presidents Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping announced on Monday. The Russian-Chinese cooperation plays a stabilizing role globally amid the growing geopolitical turbulence, Putin said. The president also said that the countries are successfully pursuing a whole range of projects in the aviation and automotive industries, as well as other sectors. Russian-Chinese trade surged by over 22 percent in the first four months of 2021, and new records can be expected by the end of the year, according to the Russian president. The Sino-Russian relations are at their highest level since the early 1950s when the then Soviet Union provided the emerging socialist China with an enormous amount of aid to, to launch the People's Republic's industry. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. Ethiopia's government declared an immediate unilateral ceasefire in the northern Tigray region this Monday after nearly eight months of deadly conflict and as rebels seized the regional capital, sending federal government officials fleeing. In a statement, the government argued that the ceasefire will enable farmers to till their land and aid groups to operate without any military movement and to engage with remnants of Tigray's former ruling party who seek peace. The announcement came shortly after the interim administration in Tigray, appointed by the federal government, fled the regional capital, Mekele, as rebel fighters entered, sparking celebrations by local residents on the streets. Federal government troops invaded Tigray in November, sparking some eight months of fighting with widespread abuses. Reported, while the UN says 350,000 people have been pushed to the brink of famine. As we all know, the time we are in right now is the rainy season. The locust swarm destroyed almost 
all of the produce in Tigray. In Tigray last year, and they couldn't collect the remaining produce because the force of destruction began the war. And after this comes to pass, and if they can't cultivate and harvest this rainy season, the problem for the community is not an easy one. It will not be one to be resolved easily, and the community will have problems for the years to come. The Arab Republic condemned on Monday the blatant United States aggression in the border region with Iraq as a flagrant violation of the integrity of the territories. In a statement issued by the Foreign Ministry, the authorities reiterated the demand that the U.S. respect the territorial integrity of both Syria and Iraq and immediately cease its attacks on the independence of the two countries. The Foreign Ministry also criticized U.S. policies in the region and stressed the need to withdraw its forces in response to the wishes of the peoples and institutions of the countries where they are located. Likewise, it was stressed that the U.S. military presence in the region serves Israeli interests. The latest statements came after the border area with Iraq in the far east of Syria's province of Deir ez-Zor was targeted early Monday morning by U.S. fighter jets. The aerial attack killed at least seven people in Syrian territory, among them child, and five members of the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces. The Pentagon claimed in its version of events, without mentioning any victims, that the so-called precision attack was ordered by President Joe Biden against alleged Iran-backed militia groups. And a video released on Monday shows killed Palestinian activists in Isar Benat being abducted by Palestinian national security officers. Palestinian media shared security camera footage showing the moment of the arrest of Benat before his assassination in Al Khalil. At his funeral a few days ago, his mother revealed to a local media outlet Al Mayadin that her son was being chased for two months by authorities. The Secretary General of the Palestinian Popular Struggle Front, Ahmed Magdalaini, stated that whoever is responsible for the death of Nisar Benat will be punished according to the law. And Iran has demanded that signatories to the nuclear deal make up their minds to save the multilateral agreement known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. The pact hangs by a threat ever since the United States withdrew under former President Donald Trump in 2018. Lengthy negotiations have been taking place in Vienna, Austria, between Iran and the remaining deal signatories, United Nations Security Council members Russia, China, the UK and France, plus Germany, on the United States' return to the agreement. Under the deal, Iran had committed itself not to enrich uranium beyond 20 percent purity in exchange for the end of economic and financial sanctions. Trump resumed and extended sanctions and Iran reciprocated by resuming uranium enrichment. In Gaza, Palestinians gather around the rubble of a tower raised by Israeli strikes last month. This time not to mourn, but to feed their spirits. Here, where the Zionist warplanes spread blood and death, Palestinian musicians performed for the fighting people in this immense concentration, the camp called Gaza. The event was dubbed Music Around the Rubble. 278 Palestinians were killed, 9,000 sustained injuries, and 77,000 were internally displaced, while over 30 medical facilities were destroyed by Israel in the last month alone. <laughs> It is a kind of entertainment and kind of a morale boosting and psychological improvement because the tower was damaged during the days of the war and the audience is happy and interacting with the songs. Today we are holding a music event among the rubble to deliver a message to the world that Gaza City, the besieged city that has been exposed to war for years, still loves life and hopes. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. 
And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesuri English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.